Here's something I know about our church. We have lots of people in our congregation who love to fish. We live in a great location for fishing between Jackson Lake and Lake Oconee. There's plenty of fishing to go around. Admittedly, I've never been much of a fisherman. (laughs) Uh, There was a time when I was younger when I liked to go fishing with my papa. But I never got into fishing as a sport. I mean, come on, people. Fishing as a sport? There's better sports out there, okay? About a year ago, I was at my grandparents' house, and they have a little lake out back. It's more like a pond, I guess, than it is a lake, uh, compared to Oconee or Jackson, that is. But they have a lake out back, and we had all gone down to sit at the dock for a while, and It had been years since I threw a line in the water, so I thought I'd just have some fun and take a pole down with me to the dock. I honestly had no intention of catching anything. (laughs) It was just something to do while we had conversation. But I've always had, I guess what some people would call, uh, how should I say it, really good luck. I've just been lucky, I guess. It wasn't two or three casts before I felt a little bite on the end of my line. And I yanked back on the thing to set the hook, and I yelled, Fish on! And I started reeling that bad boy in as fast as I could. And not for a moment, thinking about what I was going to do once I got the fish to the dock. But boy, it was a fight, okay? I was fighting for that thing, and... After a few grueling moments, I finally lifted my catch up out of of the murky water, and there, at the end of my line, was a fish no bigger than six inches. It might have been the smallest smallest catchable fish in the entire lake. But a sense of pride came over me for a few short seconds when my papa reminded me that I still needed to take the hook out and throw the thing back in the water. Now... I wonder, have any of you ever been in a situation where pure fear has caused you to completely freeze up? Okay, maybe it wasn't fear so much as it was the fact that that fish was just super icky. I didn't want to touch it, and I begged my grandfather for a few minutes to take the fish off the line for me, but he refused until, I think, he realized that I was going to let that fish die before I touched it with my bare hands. So he grabbed it from me, and two seconds later had the fish hook out, and he had tossed the little guy back into the water. Yes, it was embarrassing. Yes, it was juvenile. Yes, I deserve to be made fun of, but I did learn a valuable lesson that day. Don't cast your line if you're not mentally prepared for what comes next. Needless to say, I haven't been fishing since. It's not for me. Fishing is the backdrop of what's going on in our text this morning in Matthew chapter 4. If you have your Bible today, go ahead and grab it out and open to Matthew chapter 4. And If you're watching online with us, if you're on our website watching online, you can look up the Bible verse on that web page right there. There's a digital Bible that's handy to you. It's in the bottom right uh, corner of your screen. Below the chat box, there's a button that says Bible. Click it right there on your screen. Pop up on the side. It will be a digital Bible for you to look up Matthew chapter 4. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to do things the old-fashioned way, okay? And the old-fashioned way is uh, pulling out your cell phone, your smartphone, and looking it up on there. Unless you're watching the sermon on your smartphone, then don't do that, okay? Don't do that. Um, Grab out your physical Bible and look up Matthew 4. Those of you who are in the church building right now, uh, in our in-person gathering, grab your Bibles. If you don't have one, we've got plenty of Bibles to go around. Um, They haven't been touched in a while because we haven't been in here, so they're sanitized. Grab a Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to read uh, verses 18 and 19. Verses 18 and 19. Do you know that Jesus, as a man, had an incredible way of relating to people? He had an amazing way of being relational with people who were unlike him. 
It was like Jesus never knew a stranger. No matter what walk of life another person came from, Jesus was able to insert himself into that person's situation. We see a glimpse of, uh, we see a glimpse of that ability of Jesus right here in Matthew chapter 4. As Jesus approaches a boat on which Peter and Andrew have been fishing. Now Jesus is no fisherman. He hasn't worked on the docks. He hasn't worked on the boat. He hasn't been training to become a master angler. But for some reason, he knows exactly what to say to pique the interest of Peter and Andrew, who were lifetime fishermen. Let's read together. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee... He saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake because they were fishermen. So notice where Jesus is in relation to where Peter and Andrew are. Peter and Andrew are in the boat, and they're working. They're trying to earn their wages. They're trying to earn their catch and earn their livelihood. And where is Jesus? Well, he's not in the boat. Jesus doesn't work on the boat. He's not a fisherman. But Jesus sees these two men who are fishing and decides to approach them and extend an invitation to them. We continue in verse 19. Jesus said to Peter and Andrew, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He meets people on their own level. Jesus had in front of him a couple of fishermen, and he invited them to join him on a fishing trip of a lifetime. The invitation was specific to these men. Come with me, I will make you fishers of men. It's incredibly specific to the two men with whom he was speaking. He appealed to them in their own unique way. Can you remember how Jesus met you? Do you remember where you were or what your life circumstances were when you encountered Jesus and began following him? I was raised by parents and grandparents who exemplify Christ for us children, and that laid a firm foundation for me to build on top of as I grew older. But there came a time when my faith had to become my own. Uh, I will always remember men like Josh Abernathy, Corky Grieco, David Croom, Jake Deere, and Kurt Zaner. What do all these men have in common? (laughs) <laughs> they were my basketball coaches. I had many coaches growing up. I played basketball from a young age. But these guys were my coaches during some of the most spiritually formative years of my life. It was during a time in early high school when I was self-absorbed and didn't really know it. But it was my basketball coach who pegged me for who I really was challenged me to be better. It was a time in late high school when I was confused about my future and I flip-flopped multiple times about what God was teaching me. But it was my basketball coaches who taught me consistency, taught me commitment, and gave me the platform to stretch myself not only as a basketball player but as a leader for the Lord. It was, a time, it was a time when I felt like the wave of the real world had crashed over me during my first year of college, but it was my basketball coach who challenged me to follow God above all else and showed me grace, even when I made poor choices again and again and again through my coaches. Jesus met me right where I was. He didn't wait for me to grow up or to stop playing basketball or to change majors or make some incredible life transplant. 
he taught me about his love and his kingdom right where I was as a young basketball player. Where is Jesus meeting you? Is it through your spouse? Maybe the only person who's giving you the strength to keep going on, even though you're tired and weary of staying home all day and cooking family meals every night and cleaning up those family meals every single night or listening to screaming kids at the end of an already exhausting day or dealing with difficult people over impossible Zoom calls all day, every day. Maybe Jesus is revealing himself to you through his creation. And your morning walks are so peaceful these days. And they're life-giving as you walk past the blooming daylilies and the new green growing grass. He could be meeting you through your neighbors, your friends, or your family. The ones who call just because. And their love and compassion remind you exactly how good and loving your Savior Jesus really is. Maybe Jesus is challenging you right now and using your circumstances to grow you into the person that you will become tomorrow. Hospital bills are piling up. The car broke down. Ask the question, where is Jesus? This year, your family is smaller now than it was the year before, and Grief is so hard to work through. And you ask, where is Jesus? You see, the invitation to follow him in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, was tailored specifically for those two fishermen. But it was written in the Bible as a general invitation to the rest of us, the non-fishermen of the postmodern world. (laughs) Jesus doesn't need to transplant you to reach you. He injects himself right where you are. And the question is, have you calibrated your mind to know his voice apart from the rest? I feel like I've been missing out on sports over the last few months, and so I want to take a moment and just talk about some sports and catch up on some things, okay? Let's do that together. Hopefully, we're going to have a football season this year. Honestly, I'm not even that big of a football fan. But at least we might have some kind of sports entertainment. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a football fan this year. <laughs> that would be awesome if we had some sports. I'm looking forward to seeing some of the major changes in the NFL this year. For instance, the Atlanta Falcons picked up Todd Gurley this year. That ought to be pretty fun to watch, I hope. I hope. Tom Brady switched over to the Buccaneers, which was a pretty big headline this offseason. Over the past 20 years, Tom Brady has been uh, the quarterback for the New England Patriots. And during those 20 seasons, uh, his numbers have been pretty staggering. In 20 seasons, he started 283 games. He threw 541 touchdown passes. He broke 54 NFL records. And to top it all off, he won six Super Bowls as the leader of his team. It's incredible. He is arguably the best quarterback to ever play the game of football. I mean, the numbers don't lie. Brady is known for his ability to lead his team to victory, even when they're losing to start the second half. Oh, it still hurts. It still hurts. That was a tough loss. He knows how to call plays and run those plays to perfection. You know, if I was a football player, Tom is the guy that I'd want to play with. I would love to be his wide receiver. You know, I bet Tom Brady's the type of quarterback that expects perfection out of his teammates as well. You know, if he throws the ball to you, but the ball lands 30 yards away from where you're standing, it's more than likely that you messed up rather than who might be the best quarterback of all time messing up. You know what I'm saying? If you miss a pass and Tom is your quarterback, you don't go criticizing him You go and apologize for not being where the ball was when he threw it, okay? To win football games, you have to be where your leader is. Following your leader means being where he is at all times. The same is true not just in football or sports, but in everything from 
construction to corporate America to the military. Leaders give game plans, building plans, business plans, and battle plans to show where you need to be and how you need to do it at all times. And Jesus gives us a similar plan in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 26. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. So how do you know if you're following Jesus? Well, you might ask a common question. Where is Jesus? I do feel, though, that we need to be careful asking that question. It's possible to fall into what I'll call a where's Jesus habit. You know, I can understand non-believers asking this question. But as believers in Christ Jesus, we have to be careful not to fall into the where's Jesus habit. The where's Jesus habit is a habit believers can get stuck in. It's when a born-again Christian asks, where's Jesus, uh, to a question like, you know, I can't find a job. And so where's Jesus right now? Or, or I can't find a suitable man or woman to get married to. And so where is Jesus in this? You know, I'm missing out on things that I wish I could be a part of. It's not fair. Jesus, why aren't you with me? Or I just got let go. Where are you, Jesus? A pandemic has been sweeping across our planet. Where's Jesus in the middle of all this? There has been systemic social injustice in our country for far too long. Where is Jesus in the middle of all this habit of where's Jesus can be debilitating to our faith. And over time, this habit can cause you to forget what Jesus has already promised to his followers. He says, surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. Or maybe you might forget the words of the prophet Isaiah, for I am. And the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. John 12, verse 26. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. So maybe it's not so much a question of where's Jesus as much as it is where am I? And if the answer isn't right next to Jesus, then you might need to consider a change in your life's leadership. The invitation extended to us to follow Jesus speaks to us at head level. It collides with our better judgment. It contradicts everything we teach ourselves. Jesus' invitation asks of you to consciously step aside as the leader of your own life. Following Jesus requires you to consciously decide that he is king of your life, not you. To mentally accept that he is in charge. It hits us at head level. It takes a head change to follow Jesus. And that head change for every believer happens at the waters of baptism. Baptism takes you completely out of the equation. You give up your right to breathe as you will go underwater. You give up the function of your body as someone else holds you and plunges you below the surface. And you forfeit control over your life as Christ transplants himself to you. Revelation chapter 17 verse 14 says... These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is Lord of lords, and he is King of kings, and those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Is the Lord of lords the Lord of your life? Is the King of kings the King of your life? If not, what's stopping you from making up your mind today. Jesus said, come follow me. Today, if you are ready to accept this invitation, I challenge you to do so right now, and you don't have to do it alone. 
We want to come alongside you in that decision. And if this is you, this is what I want you to do. You can text us right now that you are ready to follow him by texting the word READY to 404-738-6264. Text the word READY to that number. And a member of our team will call you on the phone to talk with you about following through on your decision today. If you weren't comfortable sending a text message or unable to do that, you can click the prayer button at the bottom corner of the screen if you're watching on our website. And when you do, a member of our team will be connected with you to talk further about following through on your decision today to follow Jesus. And if you're unable to do that, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick up your telephone and call someone that you know who will help you get connected with the church leader so that you can follow through on your decision today. Following Jesus, following Jesus begins first at head level. It's making a conscious decision that he is king and he is Lord above all else, including yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for our meeting today. I thank you for Jesus Christ and that he extended his invitation to me right where I was. And it was the best decision I could have ever made. Jesus, I love you. I thank you. I thank you for your teaching and your sacrifice and your life that I get to claim as my own, as your follower. I love you, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen.